This is My Child Will Thrive, and I'm your host, Tara Hunkin, nutritional therapy practitioner, certified GAPS practitioner, restorative wellness practitioner, and mother. I'm thrilled to share with you the latest information, tips, resources, and tools to help you on the path to recovery for your child with ADHD, autism, sensory processing disorder, or learning disabilities. My own experiences with my daughter, combined with as much training as I can get my hands on, research I can dig into, and conferences I can attend, have helped me to develop systems and tools for parents like you who feel overwhelmed trying to help their children. So sit back as I share another great topic to help you on your journey. It's episode nine of the My Child Will Thrive podcast. And here's what's coming up, which is a phenomenon that studies show is even more apparent in the children with neurodevelopment disorders like our kids. A quick disclaimer before we get started. My Child Will Thrive is not a substitute for working with a qualified healthcare practitioner. The information provided on this podcast is not intended to diagnose or treat your child. Please consult your healthcare practitioner before implementing any information or treatments that you have learned about on this podcast. There are many gifted, passionate, and knowledgeable practitioners with hundreds, if not thousands of hours of study and clinical experience available to help guide you. Part of our goal is to give you the knowledge and tools you need to effectively advocate for your child so that you don't blindly implement each new treatment that comes along. No one knows your child better than you. No one knows your child's history like you do or can better judge what is normal or abnormal for your child. The greatest success in recovery comes from the parent being informed and asking the right questions and making the best decisions for their child in coordination with a team of qualified practitioners in different areas of specialty. Now on with the show. Welcome back to the My Child Will Thrive podcast. Today we're going to talk about the top nutrient deficiencies found in our children and what you need to know about them. More and more we're seeing our children with nutritional deficiencies which is a phenomenon that studies show is even more apparent in the children with neural development disorders like our kids with autism, ADHD, sensory processing disorders, and more. What we're going to talk about today is exploring what you need to know about some of the top nutrient deficiencies found in our kids and why why they're happening and what you can do to correct them. In a nutshell, our kids, as I mentioned already, they have multiple functional nutrient deficiencies. And when I say functional, I mean impairing their metabolic function in their body. Common nutrient deficiencies in this list are it's lawn. Um, It is a variety of the B vitamins, B6, B1, B3, B5, B12, um, vitamin C, folic acid or folate, biotin, taurine, selenium, uh, magnesium, essential fatty acids, and fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, K, and E. The deficiencies that we find are for many different reasons, being either intake of nutrients, because we've got really picky eaters in our families, and um, often inability to digest and assimilate the nutrients, which I talked uh, about digestion last week, so you can refer back to podcast number eight and the importance of digestion and what to be looking for there. And they're also sometimes the inability to convert the nutrients that they're ingesting and digesting into the active form at the cellular level. Once these deficiencies are identified, they actually can be corrected by proper diet, digestion, and or appropriate therapeutic supplementation. Let's dive in and talk about what some of these common nutrient deficiencies are and their impacts on our kids. I can't go over all that all those deficiencies today, I probably actually write a whole book on it, or we'd be on this podcast for hours to discuss each one individually. But what I'm going to do today is highlight a few of them that aren't always talked about as much, but also that are very key to helping our kids. So the first one is vitamin B6, which is also referred to as uh, pyridoxine and pyridoxal 5-phosphate or P5P. So Vitamin B6 plays an active role in over 100 enzyme reactions that mostly concern with protein metabolism. Pyridoxine is the inactive form of B6, and pyridoxal 5-phosphate, or P5P, is the active form. Why is B6 so important to our kids? Well, P5P is required in, as I said, a wide variety of metabolic functions in the body. 
and especially protein metabolism and therefore amino acid metabolism. It's also important in the central nervous system where it supports the production of the neurotransmitter GABA. P5P is also required for the metabolism of neurotransmitters, norepinephrine and acetylcholine, and it's the regulator of histamine, which is the chemical released during an allergic response. P5P is also required in sulfur metabolism and helps to recycle methyl groups, both which are critical components of the body's ability to detoxify pesticides, additives, heavy metals, and other toxins. One study by the researchers at Arizona State University found high levels of B6 in active form, pyridoxine, in children with autism, along with low levels of the cofactor vitamin C. This would then inhibit the ability to convert the inactive form, pyridoxine, to the active form, which explains why they had such a high level of the inactive form in the, in the blood. Because they were unable to convert to the active form, it causes a functional deficiency. What are the sources of B6? So although B6 is widely available in foods, it's not in, available in high amounts in most foods. And the amount of B6 available in foods is further reduced when it's been cooked or processed. The best sources of B6 are meats, organ meats in particular, fish, poultry, and unprocessed whole grains and spinach. If you go to the website under this podcast, podcast number nine, you'll find um, a link to the article I wrote on this last year, and there will be a full list in that article of uh, food sources of B6. The alternative to food sources, obviously, is supplementation. And when supplementing, ideally, you're going to want to supplement in the, the active form the, of the pyridoxal 5-phosphate or P5P. Supplementing with the active form will eliminate uh, any concern over whether the other cofactors are not present to convert the inactive form to the active form. The next nutrient I want to talk about is taurine. Taurine is an amino acid that plays an important role in brain metabolism. Taurine has been shown to be depleted, uh, sorry, the most depleted amino acid when testing the urinary output of autism spectrum disorder males in particular. So it's definitely something we want to be taking a look at. Why is taurine so important? Well, it has several functions, including a role as an inhibitory neurotransmitter, which has been found to be a factor in controlling epilepsy in particular, which is a condition which we know is often comorbid in children with neurodevelopmental disorders. Taurine also functions in electrically active tissues in the brain and heart by stabilizing cell membranes. Taurine helps preserve excess sulfur in the body so it can be used later in sulfur metabolism, again, which is a necessary part of detoxification, which is often found to be impaired in our children. And taurine aids the gallbladder function, which helps control fat digestion and improves fatty acid status. And we're going to be talking about the uh, deficiency of fatty acids in our kids. So if you know your kids are deficient in taurine, or we we assume that many of them are, what are the food sources of taurine? Taurine are meats and fish, especially shellfish. Taurine is produced in the body from the amino acid cysteine as well in the presence of, guess what, P5P. So if we have a deficiency of P5P, which we just talked about, um, then we're, our children are going to have the inability to create taurine in their body um, because it's required to convert the cysteine. The process of ma- making cysteine itself is also complex and requires multiple enzymatic steps and cofactors, uh, other vitamins in addition to the P5V I just talked about, and amino acids. It also requires um, the methylation process, which is also impaired in the in children with neurodevelopmental disorders. And for these reasons, our children are at higher risk of having a taurine deficiency, which makes diet and supplementation key. The third deficiency I want to talk about today that is really um, impacting our kids in a major way are a fatty acid deficiency. 
So we know that both research and the symptomology of our kids indicate that our children are deficient in fatty acids when they have a neurodevelopmental disorder. Let's talk about why that they are so important to fun- our, the function in our kids. If we want to look at them at the most basic level, fatty acid or fats are a source of energy, but they also play many roles in our body. So they are an important part of cell membranes. So the, the outside of all the cells in our body that make up all the tissues that make up all the organs and so on and so on. They are unnecessary for healthy liver function, which, you know, the liver is involved in detoxification and we all know how important that is to our kids. They have impaired detox systems. They are required for the absorption of fat soluble vitamins. So I listed off a number of vitamins earlier being A, D, K, and E, which are all uh, need to have only get absorbed if you have appropriate amount of fats in your diet as well. They are required for the adequate use of proteins in the body. And proteins are the building blocks of, of many of the tissues and, and necessary for enzymes, uh, to create enzymes in the body. But probably most importantly to our kids, or at least in terms of having an, a very noticeable impact, they're imperative to managing the inflammatory process in our kids' bodies. So without the right balance of fatty acids in our bodies, we are going to inflame, but we won't be able to deflame. So from this list, I think we all can see how fatty acid deficiency can cause a downward spiral in our children's health. A study from the University of California, Davis, showed that children with ASD have low levels of the fatty acid DHEA in certain phospholipids of the nervous system. These phospholipids make up 45% of the phospholipids of the nervous tissue. It's a particular type called phosphatidylalanines. I'm glad I just got that out. Um, So those particular phospholipids in the nervous tissue, um, including the white matter of the brain, the nerves, the neural tissue, and the spinal cord. Not only is this a cause for concern, as deficiency in this, these uh, directly impacts the cell structure of the brain and the nervous system, but it also impacts the cell membrane permeability and the ability of the necessary nutrients to move into the cells for metabolic function, and then the metabolic waste that's created within a cell to then move out of the cell. Another study from the National Research Center in Egypt showed that children with ASD have multiple essential fatty acid deficiencies, which then resolved along with some of the ASD symptoms when fish oil supplementation was employed. Knowing all that, we want to know what the sources of fatty acids are. So to to understand what what sources we we need to be looking at, we also need to understand what um, all different types of fatty acids are out there. So they can be broken down into two groups. The first one being essential fatty acids, or often referred to as EFAs. They are the fatty acids that are required by the body but can't be created by the body. So they must be ingested through food sources. Essential fatty acids include omega-6 linoleic acid, or LA, and omega-3 alpha linoleic acid, ALA. Fats that are conditionally essential are those that can be generated by the body from other fats if all the cofactors, which include digestion, enzymes, and other nutrients, are present. These conditionally essential fatty acids include omega-6 fatty acid, gamma-linoleic acid, or GLA, uh, acaronidonic acid, AA. I'm going to have a tongue twister test later on. And uh, the omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA. Ideally, fats are obtained through a whole food diet of pasture-raised or grass-fed meats because the animals are eating what they're intended to eat, the grass. They actually have a higher level of omega-3 fats in in the fat tissue of the meats. Free-range eggs, cold water, fatty fish, and sometimes... uh, what ends up happening when, in particular when it comes to DHA and EPA, which are tend to be harder ones to get in high quantities um, in the diet because of the volume that you would need to eat of fishes, um, that supplementation with a fish oil is necessary to get sufficient amounts. So 
quality uh, source of cod liver oil or other fish oil um, is good. And cod liver oil I, I particularly like because it also is a good source of the fat-soluble vitamins A and D, uh, which are commonly found to be deficient in our kids as well. I think from this, you can see, you know, you could write a whole volume or volumes of book of the implications of nutrient deficiency on the health of our kids. But just understanding the basics of a few of the nutrients that we are finding deficiencies in our kids of, and uh, we can then start to move forward because in terms of correcting them, the steps sometimes are similar for each of the, the deficiencies themselves. With that in mind, let's jump forward to that, just talk about why and then how we fix them. I think we've talked about some of this already, um, both today and in past yes, uh, last week's podcast uh, on digestion, but poor digestion is probably the number one reason, along with not ingesting, having a nutrient deficient diet because our kids are picky eaters. So the poor digestion means that our children aren't able to properly break down the food they're eating, and then the nutrients won't be readily available for absorption. And What I would suggest is if you want more details on digestion is refer back to podcast number eight, uh, last week's podcast, and uh, the articles that are linked there and um, I'm going to, and some of the the tools that are linked in that, that podcast as well. So the second thing would be an unhealthy GI tract, which is a result of poor digestion Um, and other factors often being it could could be um, overuse of antibiotics or um, inability to eat in a in a parasympathetic or a high stress you're in a, a sympathetic state all the time or your child is so that again the unhealthy GI tract which is typically a downstream result of poor digestion of some kind um, leaves you with unable to absorb the nece- necessary nutrients, which again leads to these functional deficiencies that our kids have. And then the last one being the inability to convert and use the nutrients at the cellular level. And this occurs often due to some genetic mutations that impair nutrient conversions and limit the cofactors that are necessary for the conversions. Uh, And it could also be uh, as a result of just uh, impaired cell membrane permeability, which we talked about before as well, which aren't allowing the nutrients to get into the cells as well. Now that we know that there's a decent likelihood our children have nutrient deficiencies, how do you determine what what they may be? Well, the first thing we're going to do is um, assess their diet. So if your child's not consuming the nutrients, then they can't, they aren't obviously getting enough. And there are some lots of great resources out there in terms of looking at what nutrients are available in um, in in the foods that the, your kids are eating, so you can get an idea of what they might be missing out on. If you're writing everything down, then you take a look um, at these resources. You're going to be able to get a better idea of what uh, nutrients they're getting through diet. Though there's a link to the one one website resource that I really like. Um, to find out what, what nutrients are in each of the foods that our kids are eating. So if, if you go to the My Child Will Thrive website, uh, podcast number eight, uh, or sorry, number nine, you will see a link to that website, which is um, WH Foods. Uh, there is also a need to assess their digestion because we've talked about how much digestion Im- impacts that. So one of the tools I've created um, after, once you've tracked their um, food and the food, mood, sleep, and poop journal, then you can take a look at the digestion cheat sheet I've created to give you an idea of what signs and symptoms are linked to different types of digestive dysfunction and what you can do about each of those. Um, and you can review this with your practitioner as well. You can also assess their digestion through a comprehensive stool analysis. Uh, so that test um, is something that you can uh, do through your practitioner and uh, get them to sit down and go over the different markers that, that are in there to help you assess the, the, the state of your child's digestion and gut health. The other thing you can do is you can have your practitioner run hair, blood, or urine testing. The best thing to do is discuss the pros and cons and the costs and benefits each with your practitioner. Um, 
you know, these tests can sometimes identify the nutrient deficiencies your child is um, having the most trouble with. But they aren't uh, doing these types of tests are not necessary uh, in order to move forward. Once you've established that your child has a nutrient deficiency or you're, you have a fairly good um, indication that that's the case, you, obviously we want to know how to fix these uh, deficiencies. So the first thing to do is ensure your diet, child's diet, is including the appropriate amounts of nutrients. Um, we want to minimize the, the, the amount of processed foods because processing the foods actually strips the nutrients out. And even if on the box or a label it says it has certain nutrients in there, they're often added back in. And because they are synthetic in nature, the body doesn't recognize them the same way and isn't able to assimilate them and utilize them the same way as th- when they're fi- found in the whole food unprocessed form. And um, obviously, we're going to do whatever we can to correct and support their digestion and gut healing uh, by using digestive supports and the gut healing protocols, um, including using a probiotic. And again, I refer back to um, the digestion cheat sheet, which I, I mentioned earlier, and I will link in the podcast show notes. In addition, I would take a look at uh, the blog post on um, the three R's to, uh, to healing uh, your child's gut. And I'll put another link to that article in the, the show notes as well. And then I would also consider, with, along with your practitioner, supplementing with therapeutic doses of the nutrients where necessary. So this is where getting the help of a qualified practitioner is really important because dosing is likely going to be different than the labeled instructions. And you have to be cautious, obviously, of in certain circumstances of uh, toxic, toxicity implications with some nutrients. So working with a qualified practitioner is really important when you decide to use therapeutic doses. It is also really important to ensure that you're using the best quality supplements you can afford. What, this is what I call professional grade supplements, and they are usually only available through a practitioner. And they are manufactured to the highest uh, quality manufacturing standards and are tested and have lots of quality controls in place. You also need to make sure that you are double checking with your practitioner that they don't have fillers or additives that your child may be allergic or sensitive to. So things such as dyes or gluten or dairy, if those are things you're avoiding. Most of the professional lines already take this into consideration but it's always good to double check. And the last thing is to make sure you're documenting everything as you go along. So you document your progress and you can use the tool that I've created, the Food, uh, Mood, Sleep, and Poop Journal, um, so that you can track when you've been supplementing because you know we're not all perfect. We don't always get them in every day when we're supposed to, but you can track when and how consistently you're supplementing or what they're eating in their diet. And start to see the changes and, and track the, um, the outcomes as well, because sometimes the changes are, are very apparent and sometimes they take time. So the more you write this down, you'll start to see the trends where things are working and where they aren't, because the last thing we want to do is be spending a lot of time on uh, a supplement therapy, for example, uh, and not knowing whether we're getting, uh, an out, uh, a, a positive outcome from doing that, because as we all know, uh, things like that are, are very costly. So what types of results can you expect from doing this type of nutritional therapy? I wish there was a really simple answer to that question. Um, when, to, when you're focusing on nu- nutrient replenishment for your child, unfortunately, as all things in these you know, with neurodevelopmental disorders like autism and ADHD and sensory processing, it's not that simple. Every child is going to respond differently, and it's dependent on what nutrients they really are deficient in and what other systems in their bodies um, are not functioning optimally at the time, so how how impaired their digestive function is. Uh, Some parents report miraculous improvements overnight with the introduction of one particular nutrient that their child was in need of, while others won't see these types of overnight results and the changes happening are not noticed for a long time. So we have to be patient and know that, you know, it's like I say, writing the ship can take some time and um, the, the slow and steady approach is usually the best. 
in terms of getting your child's health back. Um, it, it takes time and persistence, but it's well worth it uh, in the end. Thanks again for joining me today. And make sure you, if you enjoyed this podcast, please uh, jump into iTunes and give us a review so other people can hear about the My Child Will Thrive podcast. And as always, if you have questions or comments, feel free to hop on the on the blog page uh, the sh- and the podcast and show notes page and comment there. Or I would love for you to join us in the My Child Will Thrive Village Facebook group. It's a closed group for parents like us to ask questions and uh, talk back and forth with parents who understand what we're all going through. So that's a wrap. Thanks for joining me this week on My Child Will Thrive. I'm so passionate about giving you the tools and information you need to help your child recover. And as they say, it takes a village. So join us in the My Child Will Thrive Village Facebook group, where you can meet like-minded parents and stay up to date on everything we have going on at My Child Will Thrive. This is Tara Hunkin, and I'll catch you on the next podcast or over at mildchildwillthrive.com.